Good morning, church family. My name is Austin Kettle. I'm one of the pastors here um, looking after community life. It's wonderful to welcome you back here, especially if it's one of your first times with us uh, or you haven't been here for a while. And particularly if you came back last Easter, uh, sorry, last Sunday for Easter and thought, well, that's, that's kind of the big news, isn't it? And what do we do the rest of the year? And the reality is that we kind of do that. We think about the reality of what Christ has done, that Christ has risen. And then we pursue and try to figure out what that means for the whole of life. We don't move on to something different now after Easter. We stick with that magnificent news and pursue the depths of it for the rest of our lives together as we follow Christ. So stand and join me with our call to worship from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Let's pray. Lord, we do extol you, we do praise you, we do worship you. And we do that because you have made a way for us to do that in spirit and in truth by the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross and in his resurrection from the dead. So we come to you in worship this morning in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
God is our almighty king, and it is in fact impossible to call him God, to be committed to him as Lord, and yet not do what he says. Yet we do the impossible. In our sinfulness, we can know deeply, not just propositionally, but in a deeply, personally, experiential way, the goodness of God, and yet still choose to sin. And he is so gracious that he forgives us again and again and invites us to confess and keep coming back to name what should not be and yet is to him. So let's do that in our words of confession on the wall and in your worship guide. Almighty God, you have raised Jesus from the grave and crowned him Lord of all. We confess that we have not bowed before him or acknowledged his rule in our lives. We have gone along with the way of the world and failed to give him glory. Forgive us and raise us from sin that we may be your faithful people, obeying the commands of our Lord Jesus Christ, who rules the world and is head of the church, his body. Amen. And let's share together the truth from the scriptures that God hears our prayers and forgives us with these words from Romans chapter 8. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. Because we've received the spirit of adoption, we now have peace with God and with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's take a moment to pass that peace to one another. First thing to note is the Keeping Connected pad. Could someone hold up a Keeping Connected pad? I meant to bring one up. There we go. Those are on every pew. Um, do pass them along. As they come along, uh, you can take a Connect card out, fill out your details if you're new or fairly new, and find out how you can get more involved. Or a prayer card. We'd love to pray for you. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. And also, you can just note your name in there so we know who's here. And you know, if you're not here for a while, we notice that too. Um, <laughs> Good. So there's all sorts of things. You can pass any cards that you fill out in the offering plates when that comes around later. Now, a few announcements about church life. Next Sunday, April 14th, we're beginning our next session of our Discovering Grace class. Um, it's a basic introduction to the life of our church. So if you're fairly new and you're figuring out, how does this church live? What does it do? Come along and find out. It's also um, a way to meet pastors, uh, staff, church leaders, all sorts of different people, and to begin the first steps towards membership, if you'd like to. Now, you can come to Discovering Grace and not do membership. That's completely fine. But it is the first step on that journey of figuring out the life of the church and whether you might join as a member. You can RSVP on our website. That really helps us to prepare materials. Another significant change in church life starts today, which is that you may notice it's a little less stuffed in here because we are 9 a.m. service has started down the hallway in the fellowship hall. That will be going on from now on. That also means we have uh, brought to a close our 5.15 evening service. And now, if you come back in the evening, there will be many things going on, just not this service in the same way again, because we're expanding our adult Christian education offerings in the evening. Uh, there's a class starting tonight, 5.15, same time as ever, same place, in the sanctuary. So you can come back and get more. Um, we're able now to be more creative in the additional things we offer in the life of our church, in growing together and educating one another. On that note, after this service, in the 1045 um, slots, there are classes happening in the Fellowship Hall and McLean Room down the way there. And do go along and have a go. If you're a regular, great. If you've never tried it out before, go and see. Go and see what ACE is all about. We're now going to come together in prayer. Uh, before we do that, I want to call your attention once more to the flock notes in the worship guide. If you flick towards the back, you'll find um, we have all these prayer requests for one another, starting on page nine and carrying on. Please do take that home with you. Um, pray through the week. We do. Many of you do. It's a wonderful thing to be doing for one another. Uh, let me call your attention, especially to condolences section this week. Um, and there's information there about Hugh Welchel's celebration of life next Saturday here at the church. If you'd like specific prayer after the service, I'll be at the back and a member of the Board of Women will be here at the front as well. We'd love to pray with you and for you for whatever's going on in your life. Now we'll come to the Lord in prayer and we'll finish with the Lord's Prayer together. Let's pray. God, our Father, we come to you in prayer, you who rule the highest heavens, and we praise your name. We worship you, you who have all power, glory, and honor, and yet condescend to hear the merest whisper of your 
your children's hearts. We make your name great and holy, Lord, and we declare who you are to the world. Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come. We pray for the gospel to advance in the lives and hearts of every person in this world, here in the DC area and across the globe. We pray particularly for our ministry here together as a church family, that the gospel would advance in new hearts. We also pray for the work of Reformed Theological Seminary here in our area, as it prepares men and women for gospel ministry and for our mission partner, Third Millennium Ministries, as they advance the gospel through theological education here and all over the world. We pray for your will to be done on this earth, just as it already is in heaven. We pray for each of our lives, that we would live out your kingdom's principles at home, here at church, at work, at school, in every sphere you put us in without artificial boundaries between one and another, but each one under your lordship. We pray especially for our members who work in publishing this week, for their peace, patience, and grace as they do the work before them every day, especially in the grind of schedule and the challenge of deadlines. God, we are a needy people. We feel our needs acutely, both spiritual and physical. Feed us physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Our bodies fail us, so we lift up to you those who struggle with chronic pain and illness, with age, and with a multitude of ills. We pray for the families of those who've lost loved ones recently. And as our minds fail us, we pray for those who struggle among us with anxiety, fear, and mental illness. Our spirits fail us too, so we pray we lift up all among us, feeling our lack of faith, lack of kindness, our own selfishness. We ask that you change us, Father. And we need daily bread when things are going well as well as badly. So we pray for the new parents in our midst. We praise you for the blessing of new life and we pray for sleep and endurance and comfort and support. And even as we do, we stop and pray for those who wish to be parents and have not been able to. And for those parents who, in the middle of it, are struggling with all the responsibilities it requires. Please bring care, blessing, support, relief. As we've confessed already, we're a people who need grace, and we praise you for that grace that we've received. Make us more and more into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. When we're tempted, Lord, you've promised in your word that there is a way to endure it, to resist. And we confess that we very rarely take that way, seeing as harder and not a road to life. So we pray that you would deliver us from evil both the evil out there, but also the evil that wells up in our own hearts. And Lord, for all this, we would give you the glory, claiming none for ourselves. And so we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a new song. It's, uh, you can follow along on page five if you read music. Um, it's the Lord's Prayer. We'll sing it together. Earth I 
has in heaven right here in my heart. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us, forgive us as we forgive. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Good to see you. Uh, We are looking at the Gospel of Matthew this morning, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. And I'll be reading for us in just a moment verses 5 through 13 as we begin this morning a new sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sorry, it's not the Sermon on the Mount. It's uh, the Lord's Prayer. And, uh, but the Lord's Prayer is found in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. That's a slight recovery from what I meant to say. Um, it's also found in, uh, in Luke chapter 11. We're not looking at that this morning, but you could look at that later on today if you wanted. Uh, those are the two places in the Bible we find the Lord's Prayer. And uh, both of them taught to us by Jesus. That's why it's called, that's why we call it the Lord's Prayer. And in Luke chapter 11, actually, it is a response to a question. So, um, in Luke chapter 11, one of Jesus' disciples sees Jesus praying and is polite enough to let him finish. And when he finishes, he asks, Lord, teach us to pray. And the response Jesus gives is what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Um, This is why, by the way, we are calling this series Master Class, because some of you will be familiar with that idea of a master class. If you are a musician, especially like a professional musician, someone who has some professional training, you know a master class is when a master or an expert in an instrument or a field of music meets with students, usually has each student play a piece and then gives live feedback to that student, live notes on their performance and what they could have done differently. 
Or you may be more familiar with the website, uh, the service, the online classes known as Masterclass. They're all over YouTube commercials these days. And they are um, inviting you for a relatively modest annual fee, depending on how you look at it, full access to online courses by experts in a wide variety of fields. So you can take a cooking class from a professional cook or uh, how, to, how to do stand-up comedy from a comedian and on and on and on it goes. Now, when you start looking at the, the long list of classes, you will soon realize that there are probably only a few that really apply to you. Most of us don't need to take like how to compose a movie score from Hans Zimmer. You may want to, but not necessarily that important for your daily life. But I would suggest that this masterclass by Jesus on prayer is instruction that all of us need. And this is one of the reasons we're going to spend weeks in this prayer, not just one day, but weeks in this prayer, because I think if we're honest, we all recognize that this is an area where we need to learn. Like we're like that disciple who goes to Jesus and says, Teach me to pray because there is a deficiency in my prayer life. Like I, just speaking personally, I feel like a perpetual C to C minus student in prayer much of my life. And in this prayer, Jesus is not just teaching us about prayer. There's lots of parables in the Bible, in the Gospels, about prayer. You can see other prayers by the Apostle Paul and in the Old Testament by Daniel and Moses and others, but here Jesus is specifically teaching us how to pray. And I hope that we are at least curious about what Jesus himself might have to say to us about how to pray. So, with that in mind, let's look together the Gospel of Matthew. Um, We are in the Sermon on the Mount. But we are uh, looking specifically at what Jesus has to say about prayer in Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 5. Let's give our attention to God's Word. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, as we open your word, we pray that you would help us to understand what you have to teach us here. We pray, Lord, that our hearts would be attentive to ways in which we need to grow in our prayer life and by saying that ultimately our life with you, our walk with you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, It's important to know right away that uh, the Lord's Prayer is not given to us as a formula for prayer. I know many of us would love that, just tell me what to say and I'll say it. Um, There is a sense in which we recite the Lord's Prayer like we just did in corporate worship and maybe even in personal worship, but uh, Jesus is very clear that's, that's not the only proper use of the Lord's Prayer. It's intended to be for us like a model for prayer or a guide for our personal conversation with God. Notice, Jesus doesn't say, uh, when you pray, repeat after me. Uh, He says, when you pray, pray like this. Pray like this. Um, Let me show you the way to approach God in prayer, in real, authentic, meaningful, reverent conversation. Pray like this. 
And as such, we should be attentive right away to the first lesson that Jesus teaches us in this master class. When you pray, start with God. When you pray, start with with God. Because when you start with God, it transforms why you pray, how you pray, what you pray. When you start with God, it transforms why you pray, how you pray, and what you pray. First of all, let's think about how starting with God transforms why you pray. It's really interesting in this passage, before Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer, even before he tells us, instructs us what words should form our prayers, he talks about our hearts. He talks about the motivation which ought to fuel our prayers. And Jesus warns us, you know, it's very possible for you to pray for all the wrong reasons. Wrong reason number one, praying to be seen. The example he gives us in verse 5, he says, don't be like this, don't be like the hypocrite. The hypocrite who loves to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners. Why? That they might be seen by others. Now, he doesn't name the Pharisees as the hypocrites he he has in mind, but based on other things Jesus says about and to the Pharisees, like in Matthew chapter 22, we have pretty good reason he is thinking of the religious leaders of his own day who he tells us elsewhere, love to walk through the marketplace in their religious robes. Uh, They love to be greeted by others as rabbi, which was a term of respect. They love to have the best seats in the synagogue. And the reason they loved it is because they loved people thinking of them as the righteous ones as the super spiritual people, as the people who had their lives together. And Jesus says they're hypocrites on the outside, they're clean on the inside, they're just as sinful as the rest of us. But what they've done is they've taken prayer and they've hijacked it to make it about their own glory and their own reputation and making sure other people thought well of them. Um, And even though I know most of us are not clamoring to uh, pray on the street corners or even in church or maybe even in our community groups, that terrifies us, the fact is we can still take prayer and make it about us. Like we can pray with one eye open to see who is watching us and and to to imagine what they must be thinking about us. I mean, let's just be honest. Have, Have you ever found yourself in the middle of a prayer out loud with someone else hoping that that person recognizes how humble you are, how deep you are. Oh, wow. She must really be a prayer warrior to be able to pray like that. Now, little do do all these other people know, this is the first time you've prayed in weeks, but they're getting a very different impression of you that you are more than happy to accept. Let me just say, this is one of the, the hazards of the job of you know, going pro with your Christian life like I have, you know? One of the hazards of the job, one of the dangers of the job is I pray in front of a lot of people, and it's very easy for my heart to go to, I, I wonder if everyone's really thinking about me what I want them to think about me. Like, wow. <laughs> I'm not assuming that you do. But that little secret, quiet voice very easily creeps into my head and my heart praying to be seen by others as a certain kind of person. Wrong reason number two, Jesus says, praying to be heard. Now, let's be clear, as he says in this prayer and later on, God hears our prayers, and we should expect him to hear our prayers. We're not just praying to the ceiling. We're praying into thin air. We are praying to the living, personal God. And yet, Jesus says there is a way of praying which really degrades prayer to a way of coercing God to get what you want. And the example he uses here is the example of the Gentiles. The Gentiles in his day, the the pagan worshipers in his day who believed that if you just said the magic words, God would have to give you what you want. The language he uses here is heaping up empty phrases over and over again. If I just say it the right way, the right amount of times, God has to give me what I want. That's not unlike the way sometimes we treat God like 
the divine vending machine. You know, you put the right amount of change into the vending machine, the right amount of prayers, and you type in A14, and you get what you want out of the vending machine, and if you don't, you just keep shaking it and shaking it until you get what you want. And Jesus is saying, don't you see what's happened in both of these examples? Prayer, which is fundamentally a conversation with God, becomes ultimately a conversation with yourself. It's starting with yourself. It's making prayer about yourself rather than starting with God. And you'll notice what, um, what Jesus' response to this is uh, in Uh, In verse 8, he says about the Gentiles, those who are trying to find the magic words to coerce God to get them, to to, to, uh, force him to give them what they want. He says, do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Yeah, it's just like Jesus to give us a uh, a puzzle in the middle of this passage. I mean, you know the, the question that follows from that statement, uh, don't be like that because your father knows exactly what you want before you ask. And the logical question is, then why ask? Good. I think that's the question Jesus wants us to ask at this point. Because what he's saying is, it's not like when you pray, you are bringing your list of needs to the Lord. He's like, oh, I had no idea that was going on in your life. Thank you so much. I'll take care of that on Thursday, right? Uh, he's, he's saying, no, your father knows what you need. Your father. That we don't come to, um, we don't come to the Lord to perform before him or anyone else or to inform him. We come actually to meet with him, to, uh, to be with him. That, that our prayers never, um, are never meant to be a sales pitch or an audition. They're meant to be a conversation, a fellowship. I mean, can you imagine if, um, for those of us uh, who are married, if this is the way we approach speaking to our spouse? Like, hey, we're just here to make sure we have transactional information, that you have the information, or that I'm putting in the time, or I'm making sure you think a certain thing about myself. No, we know fundamentally that conversation with people we love, whether it's a spouse or a friend, is ultimately not what we get out of that conversation. It's the fact that we are together in friendship and in fellowship. And fundamentally what Jesus is saying is that prayer, the reason we pray is for intimacy with God himself. When you start with God, it transforms why you pray. It also transforms how you pray. Jesus says we need to pray as a child and as a creature. As a child and as a creature. Um, I know many of us know this prayer. Probably have known this prayer by heart for a long time. Not all of us, but many of us. And so we skip right over those first few words that are incredible that God that Jesus invites us, instructs us even, to refer to God, to address God as our Father. I mean, this cuts against the way that um, most of the people in Jesus' day thought about their conversation with God. It's much more intimate and personal than they would ever have dared. But I think it's also... um, unlike many of the ways that we address people in our lives who are important kind of people. And if you meet somebody who's, let's just say, more important than you are, I know all of you are very important people, but if you meet a dignitary or someone who clearly outranks you, you know, your first instinct is not to call them by their first name or their nickname or um, just kind of a a personal name. You you go for the formal name, you know, a title uh, or certainly like you know, their last name at best with a title in front of it. I mean, even when you're 25 and you meet your third grade teacher, she is always Mrs. Smith, right? She's never Sandy. Call me, I'm not, I I can't call you that. You're always Mrs. Smith. You're my third grade teacher. I, I just think of you in that role for the rest of my life. And yet Jesus is saying the way that we ought to speak to God is the way a child speaks to his or her father. A few moments ago, just right before the service, I was with a father and his daughter, and let me just tell you, 
this little four-year-old, five-year-old girl was not, you know, was not hesitating to talk to her father. There was no pretense. Uh, if you've ever been around toddlers as a parent or an aunt or an uncle or a brother or sister, you know that like toddlers don't walk into a room and go, is this a good time, right? <laughs> is this a good time? Should I come back? Are you busy? Uh, if they have a piece of artwork they want to show you, they're going to show you the artwork, right? If they've got a broken toy, they're in tears and they're showing you the broken toy. I mean, there is, there are no boundaries. It's full access all the time with everything they have. And Jesus says, that's the way you should pray. And yet, Jesus says, your God is your Father in heaven. Uh, that's not meant to communicate uh, a location. Like that's, where, that's Jesus' address. Uh, that's where Jesus lives. That's, this is saying this is who God is. He is the sovereign king of all. Your father is the God who made everything out of nothing. Your father is the God who appeared to Moses in the burning bush and rescued his people out of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh and led them across dry ground, across the Red Sea. Your father is the God Isaiah encountered as the Holy One lifted up, surrounded by angels singing, holy, holy, holy. Your father is the great I am, the living one, far above high and lifted up, transcendent, other, completely other in his righteousness, glory, and majesty. So that Psalm 115 says, our God dwells in the heavens. He does as he pleases. And so, yes, we approach God in prayer as our Father with boldness, with no pretense, with a confidence that he loves us as his children, and yet we also approach him as holy, with humility, as a creature, wholly dependent on him for every breath. Now, you may think to, my, to yourself, well, it seems really confusing. Like, how do I... How do I bo do both of those things? And honestly, we often oscillate between treating God like a pushover parent who just would never say no to us or, uh, or as this domineering tyrant who just never wants to say yes to us. We sort of live in this in-between space of stutter-stepping toward God or maybe just not talking to him at all because we don't know how to come to him as a child and as a creature boldly but also with humility. And this is why ultimately the Lord's Prayer is leading us back to the good news of the gospel. That it's only as we come in the name of Jesus that we experience God as the Father who delights in us and the God who make, made us and rules over all things. And that's what the gospel teaches us. It teaches us that Jesus came lived, died, rose again, that we might be welcomed into the family of God and welcomed as adopted sons and daughters of the king. This is why Jesus invites us to approach God as our Father. Uh, you might remember, if you were here last week for Easter, the conversation Jesus has with Mary outside the empty tomb. He says, uh, Mary, don't cling to me. I am returning. I am ascending to my Father and your father, our father. The gospel tells us that Jesus was rejected, that we might be accepted, that he was cast out, that we might be welcomed in. And it just raises the question, I think for some of us, for some of you this morning, maybe for many of us this morning, um, do you know God as your father? Do you know God is the, the one who delights in you, who, who sees you coming and can't wait to spend time with you? You know, the only way we know God that way is as we know God through Jesus and what Jesus has done for us in his life, death, and resurrection. 
And when we know God as Father, it liberates us now to know him as our Father in heaven. The one who loves us is also the one who can do all things. And this change is not just why we pray and how we pray, but what we pray. As you'll see the next few weeks when we work through this, uh, this prayer, um, we have what, we're, what some people call the preface or the address with our Father in heaven, and then we get to the first of several petitions or requests. And the first request, the first petition is, hallowed be your name. Now, we'll talk about the others in time, but it starts with this. One person has said this is, this is the, the best and brightest of, of all of the petitions that we have in the Lord's Prayer. It's the one that helps all of the others make sense to us. But it's also an odd word to start with. The word hallowed is not a word that we use very often, if at all. Uh, it's an old word. It's derived from the Greek word holy, and we could translate it something like um, to to make it so that others treat God's name as holy or sacred. To hallow something is to treat it as sacred or as holy or as set apart. And here in this first petition, the first request that we have of God as our Heavenly Father is that He would make it so that His name, both in our lives and in the lives of others, is considered holy and sacred. Now, to talk about the name of God really is to talk about the character of God. It's to talk about who He is and what He has done for His people in redemptive history. And so, in this very first request, what what Jesus is instructing us to ask for is that God's name would be treated as holy, righteous, set apart, sacred in our lives and in the lives of others. Now, even though this might seem like still a a strange idea, I just want you to know we do this all the time. We seek things to be, if not quite hallowed, at least appreciated in the eyes of others. So, uh, if you have a favorite author or a favorite book or a favorite restaurant or a favorite band or musician, um, it's not enough for you to enjoy that particular person as, uh, as set apart, you know, as next level. You make it your role, your job, your passion to make sure other people know that that person or that experience is, is, is next level. So, you know, you, you're handing out books or you're sending Amazon links or you're sending podcasts or playlists or you're saying you've got to go to this restaurant or you're speaking up this or talking up that. Why? Not just because that makes our joy fuller, but because we really believe that this person deserves that kind of attention, that kind of credit, that kind of fame. Well, how much more Jesus is saying, if you are a child of a living God adopted by grace into his family, should we long to see our heavenly Father lifted up through our lives and also in the eyes of others? So one thing that we're praying here simply is that we even those of us who have walked with God for a very long time, that we would have a fresh vision of God's holiness, that we would see it, because often we don't see it, and also that our lives would reflect the glory of God and the way that we live under His kingship, that others would see it, and then that that sense of set-apartness would spread into the lives of of others, that others would see God as holy and lifted up and set apart and worthy of praise as we do. So what Jesus is saying here is before we rattle off our long list of needs, we would start with God, start with adoration, start with praise. Before we, even before we confess our long list of sins, that we would start with worship and adoration and, and he's not saying that because God is somehow like easily 
offended if we start in a different place, you know? Sometimes someone just walks into a room or walks into a conversation and starts demanding things. We're like, hey, how about a hello? Hello would be nice. That's not what Jesus is saying. It's not that sort of response. Jesus understands that we need the perspective that only praise can bring about. That when we start with God, when we finally get to our long list of needs, and all of us have a long list of needs, we, we begin to recognize a greater sense of confidence that God can handle those things. Or when we get to our long list of sins after praising God for His goodness and glory and grace, we find a, a, a settled sense of assurance that he has actually dealt with our sins once and for all in Jesus and is dealing with our sins right now through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. One person has put it like this, when we start with God, he removes the anxiety that prompted the prayer in the first place. And ultimately, it makes the rest of the Lord's prayer make sense, that when we pray, we start with God, and this table helps us to do that because it reminds us that even when it comes to our relationship with God, it was His love that first found us. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks for this table, these visible emblems of your love for us, we thank you, Lord, that as we have heard the good news of the gospel, that you are our heavenly Father through the finished work of Jesus, we now get to taste and to see that the gospel is true and that we can trust you with our lives. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this table, we both remember and look forward. We look back to what Christ has done, what is accomplished and achieved. We celebrated last week the resurrection from the dead, sin dealt with, and we look ahead to what he has promised. We look ahead to the promise of that feast, that guaranteed eternity bought for us. As we look backwards and we look forwards, we find ourselves in a renewed present. The table brings us to the reality of our present between those two things with a present joy. It's Christ's table. He's the host who invites us to be fed by him, to eat the bread of life. He's the one who gives his Holy Spirit so that even as we are here together, he is present with us. And through union with Christ, we are reconciled to God and we eat this with confidence, joy and delight. It's a table for God's church a table for those for whom this has been bought. And so if you've been baptized in a Bible-believing church, please join us in this remembrance and hope at the Lord's table. It's food not just for our bodies, for our souls it's as well. It's encouragement and spiritual nourishment. Rejoice with us. And yet the Bible also warns us that if you haven't come to believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is not for you. It's uh, unwise to come and take from the Lord's table if, if that's not your belief. Don't dishonor yourself or the sacrament by taking it if this is not something you believe to be true. But instead, go away and think, consider, and even if you're not convinced that it works, pray. Ask the Lord that you might one day come to this in confidence that delight might be yours. And now, let's pray. Father, we set these elements apart from their normal use to their special use. We pray that you would meet with us in a special way as we celebrate this supper together. Christ ordained this meal, and Paul, the author of so many of the letters of the New Testament, wrote this in 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, 
he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. But whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And that's what we do together as we take communion. Please take the bread as it comes round when you're ready. But one of our traditions as a church family is to hold the cup so we can take that all together as we finish. Thank you. 
church family bought by Christ with his blood. Let's take the cup together. As we close this meal together, let me remind you that it's our tradition to take up a deacon's offering with the Lord's Supper, a fund used by our deacons to meet the material needs of those within and outside our community. So please do consider giving for, to that as we rejoice together. And if you or someone you know needs that kind of assistance, please don't be shy. There are details in the, in the worship guide about how to get in touch about that. Now let's pray for that offering and close this time of communion together. God, our Father, we come to you with humble and grateful hearts for what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Help many more to know the truth of who he is and help us to be instruments of his light and peace in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. your name, O God, From dawn to setting sun, greatness of Your glory far exceeds all human thoughts. So with each breath I bless your name. strong and mighty deeds are always here. Oh God, most high, your name will be revealed. How great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. How great is the Lord our God. How great
sisters, as the Lord sends you, go with his blessing. And now by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you so much.